Armstrong and along with my colleagues Andy Summers and Shona Common, we welcome you to another edition of the Fortnite Brunch. Thank you all for joining us. Today we are joined by an incredible group of people, all of whom have left at a once in a lifetime opportunity presented by the pandemic to rethink, reimagine and redesign our city. Today they'll be giving us some insight into how they think Glasgow might build back better. First up we have Graham Hogg, one of the founders of Lateral North and of the After the Pandemic Summer School Initiative. Hello Graham. Um, Hello. Graham has worked extensively with organizations and communities, as well as international partners across the high north, exploring the relationships between people, culture, places, industries, and economies. Over to you, Graham. Thank you, uh, Raina, and uh, thank you, uh, Andy and Shona, for inviting us and uh, the rest of the people that are presenting tonight to, uh, to talk to you about after the pandemic. Um, I'm one of, uh, one of the people that are uh, representing after the pandemic, which is an initiative that we started up uh, on May the 8th, uh, 2020. And so I'm just going to go through some of uh, some of the things that we've been doing so far, um, followed by, uh, we're going to, I'm going to introduce the, the rest of the speakers who will be involved this evening. So I'm just going to share my screen. So, um, after the pandemic launched on May the 8th, 2020, as an initiative asking how communities could both generate and initiate positive change during the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic to develop new ideas, new, new places and spaces, new systems and new products, and to tackle both immediate problems and intersecting global challenges like climate emergency. The initiative's original aim was to use creativity to rethink, reimagine and redesign Glasgow. We offered an open supportive platform for people to share ideas of how their communities might build back better from this very specific moment in time to make our spaces and places to be greener, sustainable and more resilient. We launched the initiative without much expectation of a response. We were in fact completely overwhelmed um, Circa 200 individuals from diverse backgrounds have contacted, engaged and involved themselves to date. This response overwhelmingly um, validated our intuition that there was a significant desire to express and respond creatively to this moment, but without an appropriate outlet. It also suggests that this civic creative potential exists much more widely than just Glasgow. After the pandemic Glasgow, has, given, has already given eight creative teams a public outlet, with one of them launching here this evening. On top of this, we have over 30 projects in development. These projects cover city planning, architecture, music, interior design, economics, culture and heritage, biodiversity, cultural diversity, accessibility, and many more. However, the project evolved from an existing friendship and work, working relationship between ourselves at Lateral North, who's myself and Tom on the left-hand side of this image, Fergus Bruce, who's on the right-hand side of this image, and um, Laura McCard, who uh, was behind the scenes of um, this project that we'd done in 2016, which was the 2016 Scottish Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Unfortunately, Nicola Sturgeon is still not on our team as of yet, but we're still hopeful. So we wondered what this moment, what this great pause might mean for making our communities, our spaces and places greener and more resilient. With economic recovery uh, foremost in the minds of many, we began instead asking if there should be a platform for creative and design led ideas. So we started writing, emailing, tweeting, Instagramming and discussing. We have since been deeply encouraged by the hundreds of willing collaborators who have approached us from all walks of life, all of whom who are look, all of whom who are looking to think creatively about our future. So, what do we hope to achieve? We think that this moment is a once-in-a-century chance to rethink, reimagine, and redesign. Our goal is for after the pandemic to become an accelerator for creative-led change, incubating and enabling projects that impact societies, cities, and the climate for the better. As mentioned before, after the pandemic's initial focus has been collating and actioning ideas about how our city, Glasgow, can change for the better, 
However, the pieces we have already collaborated on um, so far have been extremely diverse. Working alongside Jamie Cook uh, of the R RSA Scotland, we explored how Glasgow could think creatively about its economic model. Jamie explored the potential of using Kate Rohr's donut economic model to measure the success of the city and the region instead of using GD GDP growth, but instead putting people and communities first. Our second project launched on the 2nd of June and was the After the Pandemic Summer School. Phoebe and Mook of the Design Wains, who were collaborating alongside on, the, uh, on that project, are going to expand on this, this shortly as part of the presentation. On the 50th anniversary of the Kingston Bridge, and with talk of giving the bridge listed status, we worked alongside Solis Heritage to create a totally different version of the bridge. One that said, let's redesign the Kingston Bridge to be a lot less grey and a lot more green. We worked alongside photographers and filmmakers, both professional and amateur, as they came together to create a short film of Glasgow in lockdown, documenting the streets throughout the main lockdown period. The video was also narrated by Ricky Ross of Deacon Blue fame. The National Parks City Initiative, uh, or the, the Glasgow version of it, the Glasgow National Park City Initiative, wrote a piece for us as well, which asked a very simple question, what if Glasgow were a national park city? Scott of the GNPC is here to expand on that a little more this evening. We then had fourth year architecture student Daniel Kelly. He reflected on his Erasmus experience in bike friendly Munich and whether Glasgow could learn from the German city to usher in an era of cycling culture. Heather Claridge of Architecture and Design Scotland has also written about how Glasgow, if it were to be thrown into a second lockdown in the winter, could expand existing ideas already existing within Glasgow, um, such as the Winter Wonderland in Strathbungle, and use light to continue to engage our communities in art and culture. And finally, the eighth piece being produced as part of the After the Pandemic Initiative is by Ross Wilcock. Uh, we will launch that, and this is going to be the premiere of a video that we've produced alongside him as part of this presentation. That will be the final part of this evening. So to this evening, We've invited three of these collaborators so far to expand on the pieces that they've already developed. And our fourth presenter, Reza Karimi, is a collaborator to come. We in the Archifringe have specifically identified, these, uh, identified and invited these people to present because of the amazing work that they each do, but also because of the communities that they represent. None of them are architects or have any architectural training. Instead, they experience the city in different ways and engage with it through different means. However, if this pandemic has shown us anything, it is that people have to come together, collaborate and design new ideas. And that includes collaborating across disciplines. Our mantra as part of after the pandemic is that with crisis, there are crossroads, with crossroads, there is change, and with change, there is creativity. This evening, we are hoping that the ideas of these non-architects being given a platform to present as part of an architecture fringe event will be a chance for us to begin discussions about how we can make our places, spaces, and communities accessible for all and initiate that creativity. So this evening, we will hear from four, four pre uh, presenters, which will focus on four different scales. Reza Karimi will provide an international overview through his work. The design wains, Phoebe and Mook, will then talk about how the pandemic has made them consider how they expand out with Glasgow and also out with their own discipline. Scott will then focus on the opportunity to make Glasgow greener, healthier and wilder, before Ross closes us off talking about how he experiences the city completely differently from most of us. So firstly, I'm going to hand over to Reza, who will um, start off the presentation talking about his international experience. Awesome. Thank you, Graham, um, and Reina, Andy, uh, Shauna, and all, all the presenters for giving uh, me an opportunity uh, and platform to talk about the Hello Refugee, the project that I'm working on. Um, to start with, um, I don't know if you've got the slides, uh, Graham, uh, just a, a brief overview of what um, I'm hoping to do with the Hello Refugee.org um, is uh, in a nutshell, essentially a, a directory of services and organizations supporting refugees and asylum seekers in Scotland to start with. 
Uh, some of the services that we're looking at uh, starts with a refugee support map. Uh, and this is an interactive user-friendly online map. Uh, makes it a lot easier for asylum seekers and refugees to find services based on their locations and categories, uh, basically the support that they need, they can, they can get it uh, through the platform. It also provides a comprehensive information on each listing, including the organization's opening hours, lang languages spoken, and whether an appointment is necessary to visit. Um, a little bit of background about myself before I basically dive into all the services. Um, I, um, I'm a refugee uh, coming from Iran. I've been living in Glasgow for almost seven years. I've studied here, lived here uh, for six and a half years. Um, I've been traveling. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to travel um, a lot throughout the Europe. And I've uh, been in touch with lots of different organizations globally. Um, and now I think it's the time for me to um, take a break from what I've been doing, which is in technology and innovation, uh, to uh, supporting fellow refugees who are living in Scotland and uh, asylum seekers, and hopefully take the idea globally. Um, one of the other services that we are hoping to um, start with is education and employment, uh, in short, RIE, Refugees into Education and Employment. I've been um, having a lot of discussion, discussions with um, global organizations. Um, which I'm not going to name because of uh, the press release issues. We haven't had our press release, so you'll be seeing it and, and it kind of brief what we're hoping to do. Um, but there will be global organizations helping us uh, to train refugees uh, back into work. Uh, we've got lots of a variety of programs um, and also a, a digital support for refugee community organizations, in short, RCOs in Scotland. Uh, our services initially started um, at, uh, as offering digital services to these organizations to be able to reach out to, to, to their service users more easily. Uh, but we were now kind of uh, going internationally, looking at other um, aspects of help, uh, for example, mapping uh, Scotland to start with and the UK in different phases to be able to offer these services. Um, if we go to next slide, um, I've looked at, I've been basically asked this question, uh, diversity in the built environment and what, for example, uh, ro uh, what, what would be the role of architects uh, post pandemic and how we can basically change it. I've looked at different articles and um, as Graham said, I'm not an architect, uh, but I've look, looked at different articles and books um, and my readings came to this conclusion that um, a, a lot of discussions have been um, around built environment, they have been focusing on physical access of the built environment, or perhaps the lack of it. Um, although as the lack of physical access um, has improved over the years, the discussion has widened to address the cultural and economic access, uh, recognizing that design plays a vital role in including and often excluding some of the communities. Uh, this is the reference to inclusion by design equality, uh, the CABE, Commission for Architecture and Built Environment, which is a very good read uh, for a lot of um, arch architects and designs, and I've, I've certainly learned a lot from this, uh, basically broad ar arguments around equality. If you look at the sli uh, next slide, uh, refugees in an architecture of resettlement, again, I've looked at another great articles, I'm quoting a lot from these articles, as I said, I'm not an architect, but I've, I've certainly learned about, educated myself um, in that uh, topic. Um, this quote is by um, uh, some of the uh, authors of this great article on a city of comings and goings, where they look at um, refugees in um, West Europe uh, in, in particular. And I mentioned, it seems strange. This is looking at a, a one size fits all design. And it says, it seems strange to compare the lot of asylum seeking, fleeting, fleeing terrorist violence in Syria, waiting um, in a barracks in uh, Drenthe, uh, which is in uh, basically Netherlands, with the situation of Romanian plaster who sleeps in a caravan in Limburg, or a well-educated but average earning expat looking for a furnished rental apartment. But all these three comforts us with an inadequate relationship between city and countryside based upon stability and definitive uh, settlement in a world that at all scales in increasingly about flexibility and migration. Migration is not going to change. The climate change is actually uh, drastically changing 
uh, the migration, but um, we, we need to just look at individual solutions um, and not one size fits all. Um, I want to keep this brief and look at two quotes in the next slides. Uh, one from um, Ali, an asylum seeker who has been uh, we've been helping a lot over the pandemic, um, uh, particularly since the incident in Glasgow. Um, he's staying in one of the ho ho um, hotel accommodations in Glasgow for over four months, waiting for um, the decision from the Home Office to uh, whether interview him or not. And um, I've asked um, him this, this question, this broad question that what would you, what would be an ideal um, space for you? And uh, what he said was being able to live well in a peaceful place, an environment that is essential to my mental and physical well-being. I want freedom, a quiet place, natural beauty, open space, and an opportunity to play basketball again. These are all essential for me to stay sane during uh, this lockdown. Um, he's a national basketball player for one of the countries, again, I, I, I won't be able to mention. Um, but he's, he's, he's got aspirations for playing basketball again. He's had titles and he's also been in the World Cup of basketball. Um, again, talking to these individuals, it brings lots and lots of different questions. And um, for, for, for example, Home Office and a lot of uh, policy uh, and making bodies in Scotland whereas to whether we can help these individuals uh, get their decisions quickly, as quickly as possible. I've also had a chat uh, with a, um, an individual, uh, a refugee who's got the status in the next slide, um, Arif, who's working with us uh, at Persian and Scottish Community Group, an organization I chair um, in, in Glasgow. And um, he's a musician, he's a musician. Again, um, he's had international performances all around uh, Europe um, and in Asia. And what he said was everything from music performances and movie nights to karaoke and urban gardening. One of the main aims is to show the Scottish people that our culture is so rich and people like it so much. Um, integration works both ways, which is, which is a great again, um, sums, sums it up where as we could, when we look at integration, um, of um, a lot of uh, asylum seekers and refugees, uh, uh, in particular in Glasgow, um, been, we should be able to include uh, these these individuals and uh, to tell about their culture, uh, to tell about their place. Uh, the complexity of um, our communi uh, communities is not really explored um, in in Glasgow and in, in Scotland, in my opinion. So perhaps by uh, including these um, uh, individuals um, within the creative community design community, you are able to create solutions for uh, for the problems. Um, again, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, here to tell uh, tell you a little bit about what we do uh, at uh, Hello Refugee and another organisation, Persian Scottish Community Group. And I'd like to uh, again thank Graham and um, Archie Fringe. Cheers. Well, um, sorry. Um, thank you very much, Reza. Uh, I think we're um, we're actually going to move uh, so straight. So Arif, or finishing on Arif, is really interesting because um, Arif is actually one of the uh, as, as submitted an idea for the um, after the pandemic summer school, which ties us in very nicely with uh, with the next set of presenters. So. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, the design wings, um, who are uh, Phoebe and Mook, and uh, they're going to uh, present the next part and uh, next presentation. Hi everyone, um, thank you Graham for the introduction, um, and thank you the Keith Lynch for having both me and Phoebe here. Um, what an honour, first off. Um, we are Mook and Phoebe from the design wings, and um, in our own times, I'm a graphic designer turned first illustrator, and Phoebe is a freelance graphic designer. We've been running the Design Ways for about two years now on a voluntary basis and started this off for fun, but it's definitely, definitely been something that has grown um, to be something bigger. And that's all thanks to the close um, Glasgow design community in taking their time and their skills to help us grow our network. Um, the aim of the design reigns has always been to connect design graduates with the industry and really, really value the closeness of 
um, the Scottish creative industry and want to help our, grow our community better and open doors for people um, in the future to enter the industry. Um, we do this in a range of different ways. So firstly, we have an Instagram account where we do like a, a weekly takeover showcasing graphic design talent in Glasgow. And that's been running for almost three years now. And we really love seeing the range of skills and how people use our platform to engage with the community in different ways. Say, for example, showing their process behind the scene or showing their workspace or hosting like a Q&A um, to the audience. We also host a range of events every month. Of course, this was before the corona nightmare happened. We would do this in a Glasgow pub or a gallery or in a studio and have a good old banter and have a pint in our hands and, you know, have a, have a catch up with our friends. So um, a few of the events that we'd like to highlight today um, are mural painting with Cobalt Collective. If we could go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so mural painting with Cobalt Collective, this would happen on like a sun, sunny Saturday morning in September and the weather had us and it was amazing. Um, so that's the picture on the left and an old fashioned typography workshop with Reza Padini on the right. A portfolio review speed dating session with Warrior Studio um, in SBG3. Petra Kucha evening um, at Front Page Studio um, this was definitely one of the best events we've had last year. The reception was really great. Um, we also initiate our own exhibitions, um, Wayne's World, where we feature some of Glasgow's emerging designers who have taken their time to show their work on our Instagram account. Um, so the first edition, which is on the right side, um, was at 16 Lucasen Street Gallery. And the one on the left side was from uh, New Glasgow Society. We had, a, we had a chance to do like a, an end of year review, so it was a really good opportunity to reflect on ourselves and hear back from our community, community how we can continue to improve. Um, a more recent project we initiated was Show Off, which essentially is a Scotland-wide Glee Show catalogue. Um, so as we mentioned before, our aim through the Design Ways has always been to connect um, students or graduates with the design industry and we felt that you know it's such a shame that uh, degree shows have been cancelled and um, we just were super thankful that we are able to offer an alternative for them. Um, so we got talking to a bunch of students through like fo focus groups or surveys um, just to gather ideas on how best we can support them and here we have it. As a result, Show Off features 102 students from nine institutions across Scotland. The standard of the work has been absolutely amazing and we're super overwhelmed by the number of submissions um, that we received. We actually just got the books delivered to us last week and just putting together all of them now, um, ready to be posted next week. So um, if you ordered one, do keep an eye out because they're coming to you. Um, Another project that we've been doing um, since lockdown, just to keep our community and ourselves like creative and active somehow um, was this event in April, Worldwide Wains. Um, it was a really fun series of lighthearted quick fire briefs where um, we allowed 24 hours for each brief. We even rebranded like toilet paper, Corona beer, came up with um, a poster for the first post-lockdown party that we imagined we would have. Um, and the submissions range from silly to serious to poster um, to interface or art direction, um, which you can see here. So it's just like a broad range of creative outputs. Um, so this little attempt was a really good opportunity to check in with our community and see how everyone was doing um, and how we could connect through doing a mutual activity. And Phoebe will be able to talk more about what's next. Uh, thanks, Mick. So yeah, um, another project we've worked on over the lockdown is after the pandemic summer school. It was partly inspired by Worldwide Wayne's. Graham got in touch with us after seeing some of the great submissions, which led us to expanding the idea out a bit. 
um, After This Pandemic Summer School is a collaboration between us and the After the Pandemic Initiative. So that's Graham, Laura, McCard and Fergus Bruce. As with all of our events, we invited a member of the Wayne's community to help with the design. So Summer School was designed by Hannah Giblet, who's just graduated from GSA. She did a great job and we're really proud of how it all looks. Um, summer School is basically a series of six very loose briefs focusing on different areas of how we can improve our city after the pandemic. We strongly encouraged collaboration and had a Google Sheet sign up where you could put your name and specialism down in order to find someone with a complementary uh, skill so you could enter together. The initial briefs included topics of a second wave, making Glasgow better and more inclusive, how to use vacant and derelict land, uh, how to make Glasgow more green, the fact that social distancing is going to become the new normal. You can view all of the briefs at um, our website, atpsummerschool.co.uk. As it is a school, we thought it should have some opportunity for feedback and learning. So we ran six tutorials during the month it was open for. We had re 12 really great tutors, ranging in discipline from creative director, a doctor, a comedian, mural painter. The tutorials were a great chance to check in with those entering the competition and also just a really nice way to see people, albeit over Zoom, uh, and have some creative con conversations during the lockdown. The school, these are some of the, the tutorials. The school technically uh, ends for now um, on at our showcase on Thursday, where we will have 12 panelists comment on the standout projects submitted. We really did have a fantastic range um, and number of submissions, and we will be posting them all in our websites and socials so that they can all be seen. But on Thursday, our panellists are another star-studded cast. We've got Glasgow City Councillors, Creative Directors, people from Sustrans, Glasgow Life, Creative Scotland, along with um, people here today, <laughs> Reza. Uh, the pan uh, so please do yeah, join us on Thursday from 7 to 9 p.m. You can sign up for a link in November by searching for After the Pandemic Showcase. Um, so, we'd like to end by reflecting on how the pandemic has changed the way we work and what elements we'd like to continue on with uh, after the pandemic. Uh, for example, Show Off gave us an opportunity to, to expand our network to include the whole of Scotland. Usually we do just keep things to Glasgow, um, so as the whole project, but as the whole project was remote anyway, it made sense to open it up. This was really special and exciting for us um, as it felt like it was an opportunity to bring people together and unite them, which, you know, obviously is really fun in this time of isolation and separation. Um, it's also shown us that there are other ways to exhibit work. Apart from the classic physical exhibition, which is what we usually do, the print is or isn't dead argument has um, been ongoing since long before coronavirus. Um, but the fact that we managed to crowdfund and sell out a printed catalogue warms our hearts as graphic designers. <laughs> um, so when COVID passes, we are hoping to get back out there and run events again with a new mindset. And now we know that we don't need to um, rely on a physical space to run a great event. It's expanded our horizons and helped us think of exciting new ways to engage with people. And finally, we're changing how we work as a pair. MOOC is moving back to Thailand, which means that if we want to continue working together, we're going to have to find new ways to communicate. Uh, whilst we don't imagine that she'll be part of Wayne's in the way that she has been up until now, working together fully digitally through this whole time, has really shown us that it's so possible to successfully communicate and realise big projects together over the internet. Um, so that's a bit about us. If you have any projects you think we can collaborate or help on, please get in touch with us. You can email us at designwains at gmail.com or find us on Instagram. And also thanks again to Graham and Arky Finch for uh, yeah, giving us this platform and we'll hand back over to Graham. Um, cool, thank you very much, uh, Phoebe. So, um, one of the design uh, briefs that was part of uh, part of the after the pandemic summer school was actually um, G for green. And uh, as part of that that brief, there was a there was one which was talking about the Glasgow National Park city, um, of which we're about to hear from uh, from Scott Ferguson uh, on on that. So uh, I now invite. Scott to talk at a much more sort of regional level and uh, Glass City wide level about the work that uh, he and the, the rest of the team do as part of the Glasgow National Park City. So Scott if you want to unmute yourself and then let me know when you want me to skip onto each slide. 
Yeah, good evening everybody. Uh, thanks very much for uh, coming along this evening. It's a very odd experience speaking to an audience that you can't see, so it's a bit of a new one on me. So yes, my name is Scott Ferguson. I'm here representing the Glasgow National Park City Group. Um, we are at, at the moment a small but hopefully growing uh, group of individuals who have kind of come together uh, around this idea of um, Glasgow becoming a national park city. So what I intend to do is just explain a little bit about what uh, a, a national park city is, uh, what that might mean for Glasgow, where we had got to in the process of developing um, Glasgow as a national park city, and then what has happened as a result of uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and where we see the, the idea of a national park city aligning with the idea that we need to um, build back better uh, following the, the pandemic. Uh, so the first slide, if you, if you can. So uh, I don't know if, if many of you are familiar with um, what a national park is, but these are the, the four principles that sit behind uh, a national park in Scotland. And there's a very similar set of principles that sit behind uh, the creation of national parks and the rest of the UK. Um, what you will notice in the Scottish version is that there is nothing in there that says where a national park should be uh, created or designated. Uh, whereas in England, the, the um, set of principles does include that the, a national park should be a rural, rural area. But maybe about six years ago, an urban geographer called Daniel Raven Ellison uh, started to consider what, whether the national park principles could be applied to an urban area. Um, and he took that forward in London uh, and began with the grassroots campaign building support for the idea of applying these principles of a national park to an urban area. Um, and slowly that built into a campaign for, for London to become a world first national park city. Uh, and that happened in July last year when uh, the mayor of London declared London as a national park city. Um, about, it was maybe about 18 months ago that uh, myself and some other uh, colleagues and contacts that I have in Glasgow start to think about the idea of, of applying the, na the, the National Park City idea to Glasgow. Um, and we feel that um, Glasgow has a lot, the, the idea of a National Park City has an, an awful lot to offer Glasgow. Um, and the key core messages that we've uh, developed for Glasgow as a National Park City are in the following three slides. So the first, is for a greener city and when we talk about greener we're talking about it not just in terms of the physical environment uh, but also in terms of overall um, environmental sustainability. Uh, another principle is in the next slide um, so many of you will be aware of, of Glasgow sort of having a reputation for being not the healthiest city and particularly in terms of health inequalities being a major uh, issue for the, uh, for the city in the west of Scotland, maybe more generally. So a core principle that we want to build into the idea of Glasgow as a national park city would be a healthier city. And the final one uh, is, yes, Glasgow is, is often known as the dear green place, but um, we think there is scope to bring uh, wildlife and biodiversity uh, become to make biodiversity much more central to the way we plan and manage our city. So what has the group done? Um, the first thing is to try and get our message out there. So we have developed our online presence uh, and we have set up a website. Uh, we've got a Facebook page, uh, a Twitter, and I've started to engage with a wider audience through, through that, uh, both social media and our, our website, just trying to get the idea out there. The second strand of, of our activity has been uh, to host a number of events. So uh, our first event was um, small, uh, 
sort of by invitation event to people that were working within the green space sector to float the idea of Glasgow International Park City and uh, get some initial feedback on what we what people felt that might mean for the city. Uh, and then we've run a series of events from, from there, uh, one at, in partnership with Glasgow School of Art to look at more at the architecture and urban design element of the National Park City. Um, we had a walk around the city with a number of uh, individuals who were just interested in the idea uh, to look at some of the, the challenges that we might face. And our final event, our, our most recent event was in February, uh, where we had our first supporters event where we brought together organisations that have signed up as supporters and uh, to start to look at how we as a National Park City group could support what they're doing and uh, what those organisations might do to support getting the message out and engaging with a wider audience. Uh, so that's the final element of what we've done to date, uh, which is the next slide. Uh, so we've now signed up, I think it's now up to about 25 organisations from across the city as supporter organisations. And that's the sort of the start of building a network. Uh, and what we've been very clear about is that we do want, um, uh, mirroring a little bit how the, the campaign took shape in London, we do want to start with the grassroots organisations. So those organisations that are already doing stuff on the ground um, are already delivering a range of different activities and services. Um, and looking at how we share information, how we join up, um, and try and amplify essentially what, what a lot of organizations are already doing. We kind of recognize that there are, there's a huge range of work already going on across the city, uh, carried out by a range of organizations from um, statutory sector organizations, public sector organizations, through to voluntary sector and community sector organizations. And what the National Park City needs to do is join up the work that all those organizations are doing and build from that grassroots. Um, so we were just at the point where we'd had our first supporters event. We were starting to think um, about uh, what our next moves would be. Um, and I guess at that time, Glasgow felt a little bit like a city at a crossroads. So COP26 was, was starting to be planned. Um, Glasgow had declared a climate emergency and there were a range of different things going on. And then, obviously we were hit with uh, COVID-19 and the shutdown. Um, and that's kind of maybe put a bit of a break on what we were, what we were planning to do over this summer. But what we do see is, is the role of the, the National Park City Group is to look forward. Um, we want to try and look at what's needed for the city um, and look at how we can support and network and work with those organizations who, sh who share that vision. Um, I think it's all also clear that, um, as I mentioned before, Glasgow is a city that suffers from huge health inequalities and the, the pandemic has certainly hit uh, maybe those more deprived communities harder. So I think that really re-emphasized the need for the initi an initiative like ours, uh, like the National Park City, to really focus on health and well-being and inequalities as being something we would want to address through anything that we, that we do. Um, and one of the things that, one of the, the, the strands we've been using to discuss the National Park City idea is this idea of what if. Um, what if something we could change the city in ways that help deliver a greener city, that help deliver a healthier city and a more sustainable city. Um, and we felt that a lot of our thinking around those what ifs aligned with some of the needs that were emerging from the, the, the after the pandemic. So here are just, uh, the, as I said, the last event we ran was with our supporters and I've kind of tweaked some of the what ifs that emerged from that event to maybe focus on some of the uh, more architecture and design, uh, urban design elements. So what if the current quieter streets became a tipping point for a change to the way we design our neighborhoods um, to places where we can walk, socialize, cycle and play on a keep connected green network? What if the focus on outdoor learning was 
brought into the heart of every school or other learning environment and its surrounding neighbourhood. What if we used the, the refurbishment of buildings and the, the planning and design of new buildings to create new elements to the city's green network rather than uh, the city's grey network? Um, and so the final what if, what if that next step is for Glasgow to become a national park city. Um, so I think that leads um, maybe neatly on to the, the next presentation uh, from, um, which is focusing much more on an individual's experience of, the, uh, of Glasgow as a city. Um, because I think what we need to try and do with the National Park City is connect citizens' experience of the city with uh, organisations and other structures um, to really build a conversation about how do we make the city better for everyone. Cool, thank you very much, um, Scott. Thank you for that. Uh, as you say, I think yeah, the, the, um, the, the, that leads us very nicely into the next presentation, which uh, is um, going to be split into sort of two parts. So um, Ross, uh, Ross Wilcock is a poet and storyteller. And uh, so he's going to give us a little presentation just to start us off. And then we will um, finish off all of the presentations with a video that we have worked alongside Ross to produce. So um, I'll just ask Ross, please, if you want to start. Up. Yeah, so thank you, Graham, for introducing me. And yeah, uh, so I am uh, really grateful to be here and you know, have my voice finally heard. Um, and yeah, so I am coming from, from the point of view of someone who is um, you know, disabled and also part of the LGBT community and what I really wanted to uh, talk about was uh, how we rebuild our city to be more accessible and why that is so important. So um, as someone that said as someone who is disabled and, and LGBT, I think it's important that access becomes a key uh, fixture in how we continue to rebuild society. Um, as sustainable and eco-friendly the um, Scottish Government plans are to make the streets of our city, um, we need to look at what can be done uh, for those like myself who have, who have disabilities and access needs. Uh, also keeping in mind that rebuilding our streets are just a small part of, of it and that we need to think about how, how our events social venues and healthcare buildings are more accessible from the inside as well as as well as out. I spent many years in a wheelchair uh, and have been using a crutch and have been using crutches since the age of twelve. Uh, so I'm I'm forever reminded of difficulties our city presents having access needs. And I'm always trying to you know, use my voice um and tell people about this, but I think it's really difficult when, unless you kind of live it for yourself or see it in someone that you know, whether it's family, friend, I think it can be really difficult to really understand that when you don't have those things um, during your life. So as we ease out of this uh, weird time in our life, um, I, I, I want to look at how I can make my experience of a lack of, lack of access in the country um, and make that a thing of the past for people in the future. Um, however, I, I am aware that many buildings in the city have historical or legal issues preventing any any like massive renovations. And um, unfortunately, a lot of LGBT venues in, in Glasgow uh, and I think throughout the city, uh, throughout the country, uh, seem to have that issue uh, and what's really you know, upsetting is, is when you have a community that is so open to all and so equal, it's sad to see that, that their nightlife and, and social life venues are, um, are, you know, are in buildings that, you know, that aren't very accessible. Even something as simple as having a step to get into a venue can prevent someone from, you know, from enjoying that. And I think it's, it's you know, it's a hard pill to swallow when all you want to do is be part of something and, and belong. 
Um, but I don't want to think like that anymore. Um, and yeah, so pretty much thanks for listening. I, I hope that you take from this that access needs to become something that is at the, <clears throat> at the front of everyone's mind in future. And also that access doesn't just help people like myself. It helps, um, it helps all of us from a business standpoint, marketing standpoint, and a social standpoint. Uh, so yeah, so thank you to Graham and thank you to Ar Arky Fringe for having me uh, be part of this incredible event and giving me a platform to, to voice my opinion. And yeah, thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ross. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to um, share a video that we've developed alongside Ross, uh, which I think touches on a lot of the, a lot of the discussions that we've been having um, over uh, the past sort of 40 minutes uh, and um, talks about how we make the city and our communities, our spaces and places a lot more accessible. So we're going to try and play uh, this video across Zoom uh, to you watching on YouTube. So um, it is uh, subtitled. So uh, we, we, if, uh, if, it, if the sound doesn't quite come through, hopefully you will be able to, uh, you will be able to, to still understand. But uh, the, um, we will be posting this uh, both on our network and also uh, we'll, we'll provide the video for Archifringe to post on theirs uh, after this event, should it not work quite as well as we hope. But here we go. I have mobility issues and I'm visually impaired. But before this pandemic, I was pretty independent. I was just started my career at BBC Scotland and was living in a flat in the west end of Glasgow with two friends. This pandemic has asked us to reconsider everything in our world, from the way our towns and cities are designed, to whether or not we need to travel for a meeting or if it can just be done on Zoom. Hashtags have trended such as Build Back Better and A Green Recovery. However, what needs to start trending right now is Build Back Better for All. As a representative of the disabled community, I'm not only asking that you reconsider how we rebuild our cities as greener and more sustainable, but how we can rebuild our, our cities and countries to be more accessible for everyone, including me. Even though I did, I did rely on my parents for a few things, I was pretty independent. I, I was pretty independent, and this helped combat the ignorance that, that was held against me with my disability. As the pandemic got more serious, uh, I, I started to lose touch with my, ind with my independence, and, and everything kind of started to fall apart before my eyes. As a result, I had to move back in, in with my parents, I couldn't see anyone go anywhere and I worried about what the aftermath of this pandemic might look like. And these last few months have been really tough for me. I, like many others, had concerns about what the world would look like post-pandemic. And as I started seeing trickles of government plans for new street layouts and cycle lanes, I got really concerned about how that would affect me and other people with disabilities. As these changes are great for a greener recovery and sustainability, it does pose many issues for some, someone like me and thousands of others across Glasgow and Scotland who deal with many other disabilities and, and mobility issues. How are people living with disabilities going to navigate these new street plans? Are bars, are bars going to be allowed to extend their outside, outside seating areas? And what does this mean for people like me who are visually impaired who worry about whether, whether we might bump into the street furniture? As cycle lanes come in, um, will taxis still be able to access those streets for those of us who have limited mobility? Will, will cyclists have to take on more responsibility, such as wearing bells, for example, so that I can hear when they're coming? How will we access shops, entertainment venues and healthcare buildings? These are just some of the questions that I have. I do have hopes. I hope that this is an opportunity for us to, to redesign Glasgow so that it can be better for all. I hope this is an opportunity for the, the creative community, the decision makers and the people of Glasgow to communicate with people like me and the organisation to represent people like me to make Glasgow a, a better and more accessible place. I hope that this, this once in a century transformational change is a chance to have have a diverse range of voices, including in how we adapt Glasgow to benefit us all, including me, including those with a wide range of disabilities, including those from the LGBTQI communities, including those of all, all ethnicities and skin colours. This is my call to action. 
and a chance for us to make a greener Glasgow that benefits everyone. This is our time to build that better for all. So thank you very much, Ross, for uh, that. I think it's like a really humbling video and really inspiring as well. I'm sure that uh, everyone else that's on the panel tonight will agree with uh, with that. So thank you very much for contributing towards that. And um, I think at this point, we, uh, we're looking to invite back in Andy and Shona and Reina to uh, if, if there's questions at this point. Thank you, Graham. Yep. Um... There's a couple of questions. Uh, one from Heather Clary just asking uh, Scott if whether the stalled spaces um, program, uh, the community groups use the stalled spaces, could perhaps be um, included or uh, engaged with for the national park discussion. Yeah, I mean, we are open to any organisations becoming uh, supporters of the. Uh, the National Park City idea. So we're really at the stage where we're still trying to build that network of, of uh, organisations across the city who would see uh, Glasgow as a National Park City as being something that they would want to support. So very open to, to any organisations that want to come forward. And, and I think one of the key messages there is that it's not just organisations maybe who would traditionally be seen as, as, as green, green organisations. Um, it's really any organisation that has an interest in how we, we redesign the city around those themes of, of greener, healthier and, healthier and wilder. Okay, thank you Scott. Um, just a, a general question perhaps Graham, it was interesting, um, Mook and Phoebe were talking about um, geographically moving further apart shortly and I think what the lockdown has really reminded us all if we if we needed reminded was that technology really cuts down geographies and distance really um, and I wonder if anybody has any thoughts about how um, what we could take forward from being online for a hyper local situation in Glasgow in terms of how can technology help us to uh, close down distances between people in the in the post pandemic phase any thoughts on that uh, I mean, I can. I guess I can start off. I mean, I've been involved with conferences so far uh, that have seen people from like New Zealand uh, and Japan and uh, contribute to a conference that was held in Co uh, Cornwall. So I think that this is like a. It is. Um, there's definitely challenges that are faced, uh, but I think um, with the pandemic, but there's a lot of opportunity um, to bring a, a lot of people around the table, and I'm sure that. Uh, I'm sure that, that is the case for other for our other speakers. I don't know if any any of them want to maybe build upon that as in terms of international connection. I I mean yeah, it's it's a it's definitely sort of an interesting time for for people like us who do run um, events generally. I mean whether or not it's it's international or not, or for example, with us, it means that we've been able to expand to the whole of Scotland. I think the fact um, that everybody is in the same position has been a benefit because it's not like anyone's missing out because everyone's equally sitting behind a desk. I think it will be a bigger challenge as some of us will be able to socially distance, maybe like we'll be able to go to an outdoor venue to do an event, to then continue expanding to the rest of Scotland whether or not that will work that will be our next challenge I suppose um, but I'm really you know it's I think it's proven that anything is sort of I mean possible in these situations and it's all so much greener as well we talk about how like uh, traveling is so bad for the planet so um, I think if anything it's just sort of shown us that if we push ourselves a little bit we can make it work Come out of it with like a fresh mindset on, like you know how we've been able to do everything that we've done so far behind the screen. But then, when we come out of it and I guess re-enter re the the outside world and you know um, have this mindset of, okay, how do we practice social distancing in new event or how can we make it possible for us to attend despite the limitations? 
Um, so we have to really think about that, but it's definitely um, possible um, just yet. Anyone else would like to reply on that or there's another question? Um, there's a question also from YouTube, um, picking up a little bit on what Scott was talking about, perhaps of existing buildings and listed building regulations, um, how they could assist to accommodate positive change um, and increase access for all. Um, Graham, in, in the responses to the after the pandemic summer school so far, has there been much focus on existing buildings or? Um, I could probably pass this on to Phoebe and Luke if that's if that's okay. I, I mean, there's a, there, there's we've kind of scanned through stuff, and there there is some uh, response, but there's also ideas of like creating new spaces and new buildings as well. So maybe if uh, Phoebe and Luke want to, mm -hmm. I'd say I'd say so. Sort of, um, one of the bigger features was like existing public space, where existing sort of actual buildings is a bit more of a difficult one but existing parks existing outdoor space was definitely something that people featured on and how they can be improved i think the pandemic made it really as obviously being outside it still basically is one of the only places where we can see other people and um, there was a lot of ways about um how we can make public spaces like a bit more weatherproof and um, because obviously it's always raining in glasgow <laughs> although apparently not during the pandemic but um but actual um, existing buildings, uh, I don't, did we have? <laughs> not really, not really sort of structures. Um. Yeah, and it was interesting, I think, like, because one of the things that we talked about is, um, uh, uh, was like asking about sort of big structures like the hydro and like, you know, could it be used? Uh, that was one of the briefs. Could it could it be used uh, differently over the course of the pandemic uh, before you know sort of large crowds return um, to it? And but I think there's um, the, there's definitely in terms of like from an architectural perspective, um, it will be interesting when companies and businesses start going back into the city centre, or rather don't go uh, back into the city centre, and how we can start to like repurpose um, a lot of the offices and the spaces that are currently existing um, to be used differently, and whether that is for for education or for for other means will be really interesting. But I think um, you know if we look down at down at Dumfries and the the work that the Stove Network are doing down in Dumfries uh, on on um, on bringing people to live back on the the, the high street of of the of the town centre. I don't think there's any reason that we can't be having that discussion um, about how we repurpose buildings. Uh, and, you know, we, the pandemic has, has managed to make us realize that we can fix homelessness immediately. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's done immediately. And there's, there's other people uh, um, within the city uh, who, who need access to housing. So, um, you know, we could be looking to repurpose these spaces. Um, you know, just, just from, a, from a perspective of, of, of the National Park City and, and sort of my experience, um, and I think it, it was maybe a part of my presentation where I talked about greening of buildings. Um, yes, there's a, obviously a challenge around heritage buildings where there will be restrictions on what you can and can't do. And that you know, maybe touches on some of the stuff that Ross picked up on in terms of accessibility as well, where there's, there's challenges. Um, but there are plenty of buildings across the city where there are opportunities for using innovative greening technologies to, uh, to uh, reconnect elements of the green network across the city. Um, and I think also there's a big challenge around really making much better use of green infrastructure within new developments um, to, to look at how you maintain uh, green connectivity across the city when you're planning uh, the redesign and redevelopment of, of the elements of the city. So yes, we do see planning and design as being a key element of the, uh, the development of Glasgow as a national park city, as well as uh, what Phoebe was saying there around how do we make better use of existing open spaces, um, and particularly in terms of their multiple functions. Well, I'd mentioned um, citizen experiences and um, obviously Ross shared his personal experience of the city 
navigating that and Reza mentioned um, people he'd been liaising with about their experiences of what they would hope to encounter in the cityscape um, for mental well-being and overall well-being. Um, how, how do we feel that we can, how, how's best, how is it best to try and build in well-being as a, as a metric in this project beyond perhaps infrastructure or spatial changes? Ross, would you like to <laughs> go first? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think that you know, when it comes to things like, um, like accessible buildings and how to make things more accessible, obviously the buildings, like I, like I mentioned, a lot of like the LGBT community, a lot of their nightlife are in buildings that have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, historical reasons why you can't um, do things. But I think that, you know, like... Uh, uh, like someone mentioned, I think moving, maybe like potentially moving, um, getting new buildings that are, that aren't used that are accessible, kind of involved in the LGBT community or in in spaces where, you know, there, there's always space spaces out there that that are kind of maybe not being used to to the full capacity that could be used. And in terms of a mental health standpoint, I think that it's really important for. Uh, you know, for everyone's mental health, not just people with disabilities, that, that they do feel included in, in society. And I know that I've dealt a lot with feeling really like I don't fit in, I don't belong, because I'm kind of like excluded from certain certain social situations or certain venues because of that. So I think, you know. Uh, yeah, just to add to, um, again, that point, um, I think the design community could uh, perhaps partner or, or support design justice. Um, 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 some of the design justice advocates uh, actively obviously working with uh, policy uh, policymakers within, within, the, within the government, or, or perhaps consider uh, black and minority ethnic uh, groups, uh, and obviously, um, again, minority uh, groups, disabled groups and other uh, representative um, of these communities, um, not to bring them on board, not not just to check the box, and and actually getting them um, obviously to form partnerships uh, uh, with, with regards to policies and practices uh, to, to, to 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 frame a, a partnership with them. Um, also, the transition uh, with regards to refugees and asylum seekers, tran transition them to to a new life uh, would, would be, I think, the the key here. Providing um, a, what we do at Persian Scottish Community is what we provide a cultural um, center for um, a lot of different workshops, uh, whether it's job job training, therapy, um, and and social connections. Uh, at the end of the day. These people want social connections. Again, going back to the quote that I had from Ali, an asylum seeker, um, uh, waiting for four months uh, for, for, for a decision from home office, was to be, be able to live well in a peaceful place, an environment that is essential to my mental and physical well-being. Um, you mentioned that I want freedom, a quiet place, natural beauty, open space. Um, but we're all, um, I think, uh, on, on the same page about providing the green space, an open space for all. Um, I think including uh, these people in, in obviously co-designing a lot of um, elements that we have would be beneficial, uh, I think, to everyone um, here. Just uh, one final question from YouTube from Marion Prees. Um, I'll just quote Marion here. I don't think we are all equal behind our screen, especially in deprived areas where there's a huge digital gap with people not having access to the online events discussions, et cetera. Inequality has increased during the pandemic, making it really hard to reach people who are especially struggling dur during these times. Um, so I suppose our um, wish of coming back into real spaces is so critical, as Reza is saying, for social interaction um, and for people to, um, again, close down barriers, even though we're discussing earlier how digital space can close geographies, there's still inequality in digital access. Um, and is that something perhaps that the, the summer school is also picking up or? Um, 
Yeah, I think there's uh, there's definitely like one project that talks about um, sort of well-being within the community and how we address that through design. And um, so uh, that's um, that's a, a I think um, Phoebe might, Phoebe or Mick might be able to correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's a graphic designer uh, and um, and a, a, an architect as well who've come together to create a um, create a piece that effectively talks about kindness within the community and uh, but it's also used as like a message board to um to engage people uh, within uh, within a sort of socially distanced manner um as well so i think it's uh, i think what what um the the uh, common com commenter there has has said is very relevant uh, and um that is that the the pandemic has definitely um it's definitely got a lot a lot of negatives um and it's also got some positives uh, so i think it's uh, it's like it's trying to take forward the, the sort of positives that we are getting from it but still ensure that inclusion and uh, a diverse range of voices are included in in, in this sort of in the conversation about how we change towns and cities and places yeah absolutely i agree i i totally understand what you're saying in terms of um yeah we're not equal uh behind the screen it's something like that we've been working with uh, students who um have obviously not been able to go back to uni um during the pandemic and you know it's all very well saying that they can work from home but a lot of students don't have access to the um facilities they don't have stable internet connections they don't have a quiet place to work um and yeah no you're right it's, it's definitely something we need to make sure that we we uh, think about as we do come back um or go forward <laughs> into how, how we run our events after. There's also a comment there also just um, for the elderly to be remembered as well in terms of um, digital access. Um, well, I think that might be the end of our questions and our time. I might hand back over to Reina there to close us out. Thank you everyone. We've been given lots and lots to think about and if everyone would love to see the results, there's the showcase on Thursday at 7pm. Tickets are available on Eventbrite and we at the Fortnite Fringe will be back in two weeks. So look out for our events on Eventbrite as well. Have a good evening. See you later. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.